Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I'm Michelle Castle. I'm one of the senior managers here at the ECO. Um, this webinar that we're presenting this morning will highlight um, from our recent environmental protection report, Back to Basics, which was released earlier in November. Before we get started, I just will run through a few technical details. The presentation will take about 45 minutes, and then we'll do questions at the end. You're invited to submit questions at any time throughout the presentation using the, the question pane, which can be found on the GoToWebinar window on the right side of your screen. If you don't see the question pane, you can click on the orange arrow, which will expand your control panel. We'll hold all questions until the end of the presentation, and we'll try to respond to as many as possible in the time available. Please note that the webinar will be recorded, and it will be emailed to all registrants. In addition, both the video of the webinar and the full slides will be available on our website shortly after the presentation, where you can also find all of our reports. With that taken care of, I'd now like to introduce Commissioner Sachs to present highlights from our recent report. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Uh, oops, sorry, Michael. All right, so very soon I will be able to advance slides, at least in theory. Okay, let's try that again. All right, so we did our, uh, as you all know, I'm required to report to the legislature every year on each of energy, environment, and climate. And this is our environmental protection report, and we did it in four volumes, as you can see. Uh, in addition to accessing the report online, which you're all welcome to at any time in both official languages, we do also have it available in hard copy, both in a single page summary and as individual volumes. And if you can use hard copies of any of these materials, please let our office know, and we'd be delighted to send them to you. And we thank you for your help in getting them out into people's hands. Um, I'm going to start with the clean water volume because that's the one that most people have been asking us questions about. Um, we have two chapters in it. The first one deals with drinking water. And I, I know I don't have to remind any of you about the Walkerton contaminated water crisis in 2000, where thousands were sickened and many died. And it really drove home the need for a multi-barrier protection of our drinking water. In response, the Ontario government did pass three laws, um, two of them in 2002, the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Nutrient Management Act, um, and then in 2006, the Clean Water Act. And the Clean Water Act is designed to protect the sources of municipal drinking water. That's the first barrier that uh, Justice O'Connor called for. It only protects about 1% of Ontario's water, the direct places where municipalities take their drinking water now. Uh, so we looked at what has the Clean Water Act achieved, and we looked at three key questions, uh, the local watershed planning approach, the impact on the safety of most Ontarians drinking water, and what's missing. Um, and this is how we did it. We looked at eight of the 38 source protection plans, and as you can see, we, we picked a selection of locations across Ontario, and we looked at three of the 22 prescribed threats, manure, fuel, and waste. And just those three uh, for the eight um, sites look, required us to look at more than 500 different policies in great detail. Um, and my staff did a great job, took a lot of time. So the bottom line was, did the watershed planning process work? Yes, on the whole it did, it's not perfect, but the source protection committee is led by the conservation authorities. And if any of you are on the line, thank you for your hard work. Really did an outstanding job uh, in many cases with difficult circumstances they identified hundreds of significant threats to the sources of municipal drinking water driving home that we were really running on blind luck prior to Walkerton. Well, they created appropriate source protection policies, but they were limited in their ability to deal with some of the big threats, um, particularly there's some fuel and manure threats and old contaminated sites that the committees were just not given the power to do anything about. Does all of this improve drinking water safety? I mean, yes, uh, it's absolutely reasonable to expect that drinking water safety for customers of municipal drinking water systems will be better now. There have been thousands of actions taken. There are, um, there are more probably coming. There's better monitoring going on. So yes, we expect that drinking water safety has been improved, but only for some people. So if we look at who's been left out, uh, nearly a fifth of Ontario's population has been completely left out of the Clean Water Act. That includes every single person who relies on a private well. 
It includes most of the indigenous communities and includes some of the northern communities who've really been left on their own, even though those hundreds of significant threats that are facing municipal drinking water sources, we can expect the same kinds of threats to be affecting other water sources, and yet those folks are left pretty much on their own. Um, even on municipal drinking water, the sources are not fully protected. Um, as I said, committees lack the necessary tools for at least some threats, including fuel, which can badly contaminate drinking water for a very long period of time, and manure, which was the source of the problem in the Walkerton tragedy itself. Um, and the biggest problem probably is that it looks as if the money is going to run out. So the original trigger for the Walkerton water crisis, as you will remember, was a, a deep budget cuts by the provincial government with no attention to the environmental consequences, and we ended up with Walkerton. And here we are again, and it appears that the government is not planning to provide any funding for source water protection after this fiscal year runs out. And uh, it looks as if the province is going to turn its back on source water protection. And that's something that I think should be of serious concern to Ontarians. So looking ahead, the Clean Water Act was a good law. It's been good for Ontarians. But we just can't sit on our hands and assume that everything's going to be fine from now on. The threats are growing. Population growth increases new threats. Climate change increases threats. The loss of natural buffers makes water courses more vulnerable. And of course, there's new fuels and new chemicals all the time. So um, I think it will be a, a very big risk to do for the province to turn its back on this program. The second thing we looked at was, all right, that's municipal sources of drinking water. As they say, maybe 1% of Ontario's water. What about the other 99%? Is it protected? And people tend to assume that we in Ontario are doing a good job in looking after our water. After all, we've had water protection laws for more than 50 years. And some things were worse 50 years ago, but there's still an astonishing number of gaps deliberately left in provincial uh, water protection laws and enforcement. And that those gaps are causing big damage. And so I, I would needed to go back to basics and say, listen, fresh water is precious. So why is the government allowing so much filth to flow into it day after day, year after year, as if it didn't matter? So we picked four of the biggest, worst examples to look at. Raw municipal sewage, agricultural runoff, industrial toxics, and road salt. And in each of those cases, what we found was that deliberate gaps in the provincial government policy and enforcement are allowing these problems to go unresolved year after year, decade after decade, with the consequences piling up. So we looked first at raw municipal sewage. I mean, this, this is filth, right? This is human excrement, uh, mucus, blood, urine, um, soaps, paper, condoms, all kinds of just everything people put in toilets, everything that goes down drains. Um, and for combined sewers, it's also everything that washes off the road. So whether it's animal poop, uh, fuel, bits of tires, bits of, bits of cars, it all goes into the sewers. And the point is to keep it there so it doesn't go directly into lakes and rivers. And so it was really appalling to find out that there were 1,327 times last year alone that we know of where municipalities discharged raw sewage directly into lakes and rivers. Um, and that is what often leads to village beach closures. So in Toronto alone, for example, on the uh, the, the uh, Marie Curtis Beach was too polluted for it to be used safely about a third of the time for the last 10 years, mostly because of combined sewer overflows. Um, oh yes, and I think, yes, 44 municipalities across Ontario have these combined sewers. Uh, Toronto alone, nearly a quarter of the city is still served by combined sewers. So the law says that it's illegal to put contaminants into water. So why is it happening year after year after year? There is an excuse for municipalities if they are using all due diligence, which is defined as meaning all reasonable care, everything they could reasonably do to prevent the offense. Are they doing that? But we don't think so. We looked at the 44 municipalities and we looked at the number of things that they could be doing to reduce, minimize combined sewer overflows and we didn't find anyone who was doing everything that they can. One thing that a number of municipalities are doing is putting in concrete and you know big 
gray infrastructure can definitely be helped. It's hugely expensive. It takes a long time to build. We do see some benefits from it. Big storage tanks, for example, being built in Hamilton and, uh, and in Toronto. Kingston's also done some infrastructure, and that's great. But it's slow. It's very, very expensive. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that nobody has the money to do. But it's not the only thing. So we have to look at also other ways of reducing the amount of fluid that's in these sewers that then overflows. And that's at every level. First of all, why is there so much sanitary sewage in these sewers? Well, the first thing is there are there aggressive water conservation programs. We reported on that last year. Very few municipalities have aggressive water conservation programs. Then keeping groundwater out of combined sewers, leak prevention is very important so groundwater doesn't just flow into the sewers, increasing the amount of liquid. We reported on that last year, very weak leak prevention programs. And then there's the, the largest issue, which is keeping stormwater out of these combined sewers. And municipalities have a number of tools for doing this, and we don't see anybody who's using them to their full effect. Uh, preserving wetlands is incredibly important to absorb water when it falls. That's even more important as climate change makes rainfall intensity increase. Stormwater fees to give private property owners a financial reason to keep the water where it falls, which is also important to keep the trees alive. Using green infrastructure, better land use planning, so we're not intensifying land use that pours into combined sewers. Bottom line is there's a lot of tools that municipalities have short of just building concrete. And we don't see anybody using them all. And we don't see the province using its, uh, fulfilling its legal obligation to enforce the law. Uh, in fact, the province has a policy and has had it for nearly 20 years that everybody with a combined sewer it has to have an implemented pollution prevention and control plan. And the province has, has really done nothing about this. Only about half the municipalities even have these plans. Most of them aren't public. The province doesn't enforce them. They don't ensure that the municipalities have full cost recovery, which again, Mr. Justice O'Connor recommended after Walkerton. So most of the municipalities don't even have money to properly deal with their stormwater and combined sewers. So they basically treat it as if this doesn't much matter. And so, of course, it keeps happening year after year after year. Second major one is phosphorus leading to algae uh, blooms. These algae blooms, they're not just visible from space. Many of them are toxic. Uh, they alter ecosystems. They damage fishing. They can actually make it too dangerous to swim in the water. Um, they certainly raise the cost of treating drinking water. They and they degrade the water we depend on in really serious ways that, again, climate change makes worse. Agricultural runoff isn't the only cause of algae. There's a lot of different sources of nutrients. But in many areas that have the worst algae problems, particularly in southwestern Ontario, the major source is agricultural runoff. And this has been the case for a long time. The Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, they're responsible for regulating agriculture and they have been talking about this for a long time, um, but they really don't take very much in the way of effective action. They encourage best management practices, they don't track them, they don't evaluate them, they don't do any monitoring to test to see if the water is actually improving as these plans are adopted. Um, only about less than half of the manure spreading in Ontario is governed under the Nutrient Management Act, which was trumpeted as the big solution to this. Uh, only a few farms are required to monitor the phosphorus that they put on the land and assess the risk of nutrient loss. Um, the province still allows manure and fertilizer to be spread on frozen ground in the winter, which both Manitoba and Quebec have banned because it doesn't help the crops and it greatly increases the runoff into surface water, so it pollutes water. And at the very same time, the ministry is still using public money to subsidize wetland destruction. And that wetland destruction increases erosion, which in turn increases the phosphorus runoff, which increases the algae problem. So we have a mixture of ineffective public policy, blind without adequate monitoring, and positively damaging actions. So as climate change gets worse, no surprise to see the algae problem getting worse. Third one is industrial toxics. Um, in Ontario's industry reports to the National Pollutant Release Inventory that they discharge more than 50 toxic substances directly into, directly and indirectly into lakes and rivers, and many of those are heavy metals, carcinogens, um, you know, the sort of thing that 
have lasting effects on our waters, on human health, on environmental health, and are incredibly expensive to try to clean up after we let them go into the water. So the province 25 years ago said they were going to do something about this. And in fact, they, they did a lot of work in the 1980s and 1990s. And uh, there were some regulations adopted early in the 1990s to regulate municipal, to, oh, sorry, industrial toxics. And the province matched it then so that they set limits that the industry could use with 1980s technology. And they promised to keep the regulations up to date as technology improved and as the ability of lakes and rivers to absorb all this filth decreased, which of course has happened. But they've never done it. They have never updated the regulations. And this goal of virtually eliminating the discharge of persisting toxics has essentially been abandoned. Nothing has been done to make it happen. Uh, the province points to the uh, the toxic uh, reduction, sorry, the Toxic Substances Control Act, which I forget. The Toxic Reductions Act. Thank you, the Toxic <laughs> Reductions Act. But anyway, the stats show that that really hasn't done very much. Um, and so effectively, this goal has been abandoned. The fourth major pollutant is road salt, which we, we tend to take for granted. We're so used to seeing it everywhere, we tend to pay no attention to what its adverse consequences are, but it has huge adverse consequences. It poisons water and snow. It's directly harmful to plants and fish. It makes the metals that are already in the water more toxic. It even changes how lakes absorb oxygen by changing the specific gravity of the water, making it harder for the lakes to turn over, which they have to do to bring oxygen into the deeper water where the fish need it. And it doesn't just have environmental impacts. It also has big economic impacts. Salt is corrosive. You probably already know it damages your boots, it damages your car, it damages infrastructure, it kills street trees, it has enormous consequences. And the crazy thing about this is the province never counts those. They say salt is cheap. But of course salt is cheap if you don't count any of the damage that it does. It's also often over applied, especially by the private sector. Um, we know that municipalities are supposed to have salt management plans, but not all of them do. Some of them still store their salt without even covering it outdoors so that the salt just runs off. Um, so a lot of the salt that's used, maybe a quarter of the salt that's used, is wasted, like completely wasted, does environmental harm without providing any benefit for public safety. And we know that Ontario hasn't made any major commitment to finding alternatives or to properly assessing whether salt is really cheap by counting the, co the costs. So you put all those things together, and what we see is persistent regulatory failures by the province, which are deliberately year after year, decade after decade, allowing huge amounts of damaging pollution to flow into our surface and groundwater. It's not inevitable. It's not necessary. We shouldn't be tolerating it. It's not even cost effective. It only looks cost effective if you don't look at the, at the impacts, and the impacts matter. So. I don't think Ontario should keep tolerating these regulatory failures that are allowing such pollution. And we do acknowledge in the report the inspiration from Josephine Mandamin, who walked around the Great Lakes on by herself, 10,900 kilometers, carrying a heavy bucket of water to remind us that water is precious. Water is precious. The third volume is about wildlife and wilderness and really about science and monitoring and how, how good a job do we do in Ontario to even keep track of our biodiversity. I, I hope I don't have to tell anybody on this call that we're in a crisis in terms of loss of biodiversity. Um, it's, uh, it threatens, basically we're cutting down the tree of life. And this is going to have real huge consequences for the world that we live in and that we want our kids to be able to live in. And the very first step before we can even figure out what to do is, do we know what's happening? And the short answer is, well, we know some things. And some of that is due to citizen science. So thank you very much. If there's anybody here who contributes their observations, that's becoming very important. We hear that about 40% of the actual field observations that the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry now uses are coming from you and me, people who walk around with a supercomputer and a camera in their pocket and take pictures and submit them. Encourage everybody to download iNaturalist and use it if you have opportunities when you, you're out to, uh, in the woods or in the countryside or even in the city to keep a, a, an eye out for biodiversity and submit the, the photos. 
And there's also a growing recognition of the important role of indigenous communities who often live on the land, have detailed generation-long knowledge of the places that they live and the creatures that they share it with, and have information that's very important to share. Um, the government is also doing some monitoring. They do collect a lot of data and that's great, but it's quite uneven and it's not brought together very well to give the big picture. And we need the big picture in order to decide what to prioritize, especially when government resources are constrained, which uh, I think we all expect is going to be under this government. Well, what should we be using the money on? Where's the best bang for the buck? If we don't know where the issues are, we don't know how to spend it. So fortunately, we are all very much indebted to the voluntary work done by the Ontario Biodiversity Council, who get minimal support from the government, no secure funding over the long run. And these are the only people who are giving us any insight into the big picture of biodiversity in Ontario. So thank you very much to everyone who contributes to that. And the province should be embarrassed that it won't even commit long-term funding, uh, this pittance that it provides the biodiversity council. Second piece of that is, uh, again, about monitoring, but specifically about the threat of disease. There are many, many threats to biodiversity in Ontario. One of the biggest is habitat loss and, of course, climate change. But the specific issue of wildlife disease has very severe and, and can rapidly grow in consequences, and it is one that is specifically dependent on good monitoring and detection. So it matters, it can have devastating impacts, and very few people realize that how much human disease comes from wildlife. And that includes three quarters of the emerging diseases today are coming from wildlife. We, we need to know what's going on in there or we're just running blind. We've got lots of new threats on the horizon. We can see in Ontario the decline in bat populations. Chronic wasting disease, which is uh, can run like fire through both wild and domesticated populations. It's been found in deer just across the border in Quebec. It's in all five states to the south of us. It's in the prairie provinces to the west of us and could have devastating consequences here. We've got emerging human diseases. And Ontario is really vulnerable. We're a big trading province. We're in the middle of the continent, basically. And there's a huge movement of goods and wildlife across our boundaries. So we're, we're in the crosshairs. We could very easily find ourselves with new diseases to manage. There's some possibility of effective response if we know right away, and that depends on good detection. Climate change is also going to, uh, increases the stresses and increases the risk of new diseases. Um, it makes it easier. I mean, this is a story, of course, of Lyme disease in West Nile. It didn't used to be found here because it used to be too cold in the winter, and now it isn't. But it also affects the susceptibility to disease. So let's see if I can say this correctly. Viral hemorrhagic septicemia. I think I'm close. Um, so this is a, a viral disease that has been commonly found in waters in Ontario, but fish have always been able to survive it, or almost always. It's, it's there, they live with it, and by and large, they survive it. But when climate change warms the water, warmer water holds less oxygen. Water with less oxygen stresses the fish. When the fish are stressed and struggling just to get the oxygen they need, they can succumb to these diseases. And we saw, for example, a huge kill of rainbow smelt this spring in Lake Nipigon as the waters are warming to levels that we've never seen before. So early detection is absolutely key. This is the critical surveillance depends on staff and money. And it really depends on our partners. We depend very, very heavily on the wildlife cooperative and or the wildlife health cooperative, and we don't provide it with any consistent funding. So, this is a story we see over and over again in Ontario. The government likes to talk about its partners, um, but it doesn't like to provide those partners with any kind of secure funding that can allow them to hire people and do long-term planning. And that gets us to wetlands and woodlands, uh, starting first with wetlands. Again, I'm assuming with this audience, I don't have to tell you why wetlands are important. Wetlands are really, 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 really important for all kinds of things and incredibly important, not only for species at risk, but specifically for our ability to withstand climate change and the floods and droughts that it brings. We're in bad shape on wetlands. We've lost most of the wetlands in Southern Ontario and what's left is still being destroyed. Um, and we've really got some areas of Ontario with extreme wetland losses. So what you can see on this slide is on the left-hand side, you can see 
historical wetland losses, the areas in Ontario that have lost most of its wetlands up to about 2002. You can see on the right hand slide the areas that have got the fastest ongoing wetland loss in the most recent available data, which is for the first decade of this century. And you can see the we're still losing wetlands. We're still losing wetlands even though we're in really bad shape. Um, According to Environment Canada, the minimum level of wetlands we need for a healthy watersheds, healthy hydrological cycles, basically somewhere for the water to go when it rains and for the water to stay until we need it in the droughts. We need 10%. Essex County, just upstream of Windsor, down to 1.5% wetland cover. St. Lynn's, so they've given up 85% of their minimum necessary protection from water, so no surprise they keep flooding. And the St. Clair Conservation Watershed, right next door to Essex County, they've given up 99% of the wetlands that they need for minimally healthy water handling in their area. And so what do you expect to get? I mean, we know that even small wetlands can retain runoff from an area 70 times its size. If there's nowhere to hold the water, we can expect floods, we can expect droughts. So. Why are the wetlands disappearing? Oh, there's no real doubt about it. It's still mostly agriculture. Um, development and infrastructure is a lot of it. Um, but, but the big cause is still agriculture. So the government has been claiming for years that they're protecting wetlands, but their system simply does not work. You can tell that a number of ways. The simplest way you can tell is that wetlands are still disappearing. That tells us we don't have balance. If we're constantly losing ground, we don't have balance. And the fundamental reason is that their whole idea is, is uh, fundamentally flawed. We've had lots of evidence that you don't protect anything until you've studied it in great detail and announced that it's provincially significant. That doesn't work. And in Ontario, we have a 260 year backlog in assessing wetlands. And even that doesn't even apply to the smaller wetlands, which are better at filtering um, uh, pollution and very, very important for wildlife. We don't even count those. So we have no system that even in principle could effectively protect wetlands. It simply does not work and it is not working. So if we want to protect the wetlands, which we should, we need to treat them all as worthy of protection and then they need real protection once we know they're worthy because we pretend they do right now, but it's, it's, it's full of barn doors. And uh, again, wetlands are continuously being destroyed and degraded. Conservation authorities, we often think, should be able to protect us from wetland loss. They, they do have some powers, but they've been severely handicapped by lack of resources, by lack of provincial direction, by bad definitions, and by not being brought into things until the very last second. Um, and so the consequences are many of them are unwilling or unable to enforce the regulations. There's a lot of uncertainty and certainty creates, creates conflict that sucks up time and resources and the system simply doesn't work. But it could. I mean, again, from the work we've done on the Clean Water Act, we can see if you give conservation authorities a chance and some resources, they do a stupendous job. They are deeply committed. They've got very good staff. They know their areas. They care about it. Give them a chance they can do the job. Wait, the province isn't doing that. Uh, another part of the issue is wetland stewardship on private land. We know that a lot of private property owners have wetlands and what we've got is a situation where the benefits and burdens are out of sync. Everyone in the area benefits, everyone downstream benefits if there's a wetland preserved somewhere to hold the water so they don't flood, but they don't pay for it. All the costs fall on the property owner. And so when we have this complete disproportion between cost and benefits, it's no surprise that property owners over and over again decide to drain or plow their wetlands, especially if the province will help pay for draining the wetland, which it does. So we need better incentives, we need better provincial policy, and the, uh, the fact is that the current policy isn't working and it's got too much red tape and um, too many rules that don't allow enough protection. Government has uh, an excuse for the wetland destruction. They say, well, they're going to have offsetting. So we're going to let a, a, re, a, a natural wetland be destroyed and we're going to claim that we're going to create an artificial one someplace else. 
it's no substitute. By and large, they do not work nearly as well as the original wetland. There have been some studies showing even 100 years later, these artificial wetlands do not effectively replace the wetland that they supposedly replace. Many of the features are not replaceable. So offsetting is a really bad, dangerous tool. There are some times when it's essential and there are some times it can work, especially if what you're doing is not trying to create an artificial wetland, but restoring one that was destroyed. And you can see a picture here. The Toronto Region Conservation Authority has got some great success stories where they were able to block the tile drains that had destroyed wetlands and agricultural land, and even after 100 years, bring back that wetland to health. So sometimes that can work. Um, so it should be an absolute last resort. There are some ways it can be used, um, but you know we don't have we don't have good rules for it yet, and we're not taking seriously enough how difficult it is to do this well, and and how little value we get from it. So here's the summary. If we want to protect what we have left, there are things we can do, but it requires significant change in current government policy, and we're not seeing any of these things happen right now. Much the same story in terms of forests. Uh, again, I don't think I need to tell any of you why forests are important. Forests are really important. If you have any questions, ask me later. Forests are really, really important. We've got another slide saying forests are really, really important. Um, yeah, forests are really important. And how much forest do we need? Well, again, we've got the stats. If we want a really healthy ecosystem and water system, we need to have about 50% forest. Well, OK, we don't have that. We'll cut down most of those trees. Um, Minimum for a very high risk approach of marginal health in ecosystems and marginal water holding is 30%. We're way below that in southern Ontario. And particularly, as you can see from the picture, the further southwest you go, the less forest there is. Essex County is down to 3%. So not only have they destroyed almost all of their wetlands, they've also destroyed almost all of their forests. They are left completely naked to floods and droughts. Um, and one of the crazy things is we've been down this road before. A century ago, Ontario had a crisis because we had cut down too many trees. And the, the devastation was enormous. And so the provincial government um, embarked on almost 100 years of programs to aggressively support replanting of forests. And a lot of the forests we saw or see in southern Ontario were planted under those programs. But those programs have all been gone now. So there's lots of lots of threats to forests. Uh, they're getting eroded bit by bit by bit. Again, we know that government policy to protect forests isn't working because we can see every year that there are fewer of them. Um, there are supposed to be some protections in the provincial policy statement, but they don't work, and they're full of barn doors, which continue to cause forest loss year after year after year. Uh, we also see that there is very little effective afforestation on private land, even though property owners are often willing to host trees, as, uh, as they have for many years. The afforestation programs mostly don't exist anymore. The seed plant has been closed, which was the only place to get reliable sources of local appropriate seeds so we can plant the right trees for the next 100 years. Um, there is a tax program to try to encourage forests, but it's not competitive anymore. It's got far too much red tape. It doesn't apply to the right people. And there's no support anymore for planting costs and for tree maintenance costs. So by and large, uh, what we find is that not many people are willing to pay to put trees on their land, even if they're willing to have trees on their land. And again, it's the question, who benefits? Everybody around benefits. Who pays? All the cost is on the landowner. No surprise, that doesn't work. And so we continue to lose the forests that we need. Problems even more extreme in urban areas. Urban forests are highly, highly important to uh, human welfare, mental health, physical health, cooling the air in the extreme heat that we're going to be having more and more, um, pro providing shade, providing some kind of habitat. And those forests are degrading. It takes a lot of money to look after them, and municipalities are being are being starved, and most of them don't have the money to pay to look after their forests. There's also a lack of expertise in many places, and there's a lot of legacy issues where 
the soil's been stripped away and the uh, there's no place for the roots and there's compaction and there's salt contamination, a huge problem. There's also a big problem with invasive species having been planted like Norway maples and so on. So we don't have appropriate trees. And of course, giving up the tree plants, we don't even have appropriate seeds anymore. It's going to make all of that worse. There is a, you know, very inexpensive way of at least starting to change that by creating a center of excellence and knowledge that could support urban forests as has been done in other jurisdictions. Again, no sign that the interior government recognizes either the problem or the need to do anything about it. So the final um, section here, this is about volume one of the report. This is process issues very, very dear to our heart, um, but I know not always uh, not always as interesting to some other folks. So we've been doing a lot to um, support the Bill of Rights, as you know, over the last 24 years. Uh, this whole report was about the April 1st, 2017 to March 31st, 2018 fiscal year. We, the Environmental Registry has been used very heavily during this time. It's uh, public using it more and more. Uh, lots of proposals were commented on, especially on water bottling and water taking. This is uh, last year, this year, of course, 11,000 people took the time to comment on Bill 4. Not that their comments seemed to have had any influence on the bill, but at least people did use their environmental rights and commented. Uh, there is this new environmental registry. This is a this is a great thing because the registry software stunk. Uh, this is a beta. It only covers policies, acts, and regulations from the last two years, but it is enormously better. And at least current indications are that the government does intend, intend to continue to expand it, to bring on some you know, instruments and some of the older notices, and that would be very good news. This is accessible from mobile devices. It works much better. And at the same time that the registry was adopted, the government did go to some long overdue effort to teach people who write the notices how to write them in plain English that people might understand. Our office has also been working with the environmental officers in the different ministries to promote a plain language approach. And I think you'll see there's a much more accessible, understandable kind of language in these notices than we used to have. So that's a good thing. Um, uh, I do issue a given award every year to government staff for going above and beyond something that really protects the environment. And this year, um, our support is for the role of several ministries in supporting the Mishkegawa Climate Summits. That is to really recognize and acknowledge the importance of traditional indigenous knowledge to amplify um, Western science to understand climate change. One of the critical problems for scientists in assessing climate change is the lack of historical data. Well, the First Nations have lived in these areas for thousands of years and they have an oral tradition that is the best information we've got in many cases about what has been happening in those areas. So we need to find a way to make those work together. And uh, these Mishkegawa climate summits were a really important way to, to make some of that happen. Applications for review and investigation, important tools under the EBR. Glad to see that they've been used much more uh, in the last five years and that certainly under the previous government, they were treated with more respect. They were taken more seriously. Um, there we been we always, of course, uh, publish our evaluation of the decisions. And you can see, all right, there definitely were some problems, um, but at least some of these were decided and uh, some of them are making things better. There's investigations as well. These are cases where there have been long running breaches of the law that ministry has not dealt with properly in its normal process. And so the request for investigation process at least uh, get some in investigation, some attention being paid to these issues. Not as much as we think they should do, but better than nothing. Uh, and the soil health uh, is an example of a success story where two individual farmers in Ontario took the initiative to come to the province and say, you are missing something incredibly important on soil health. Your policies are not doing the right thing. Look at the impact. And to give them credit, the province admitted that they were right and did a, a, a lot of work and has developed this soil health strategy. Again, could be stronger, but it's a big step in the right direction. And finally, how is the government doing in complying with its obligations under the EB or other than applications for review? So we do issue a report card every year since I became commissioner, and this has really helped. It's amazing, actually, how much it has got people's attention and got the ministries to perform better. Um, 
always room for improvement, but the notices are improving, they're more up to date, the applications for review have been handled up until now um, in a more timely fashion, which is good because before they were you know, eight, nine, ten years out of date showing immense disrespect to the public. Uh, lots more work to be done, but we have been continuing to work, work on it with ministries and uh, things definitely have been improved. If you want to know more about that, we have a specific page on our website and the government's, each ministry responds to their report card every year. You can probably guess what they say, but anyway, sometimes they're fun to read. So, we are incredibly lucky. Everybody who lives in this province, we are incredibly lucky to live here. It's a beautiful province. If we wanted to stay that way, we have to look after it. It isn't going to happen by itself. So, thank you very much. Anybody have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you very much, Commissioner. So we'll now start taking some questions from the audience. I'll just remind you before I do that you can submit questions using the question pane on the GoToWebinar window. If you don't see this option, use the orange arrow to expand the control panel. Okay, so I'll start with our first question for the Commissioner. I heard the news about the cuts to the Environmental Commissioner's Office. Is this going to be your last report? I don't know what my personal status is going to be after the legislation is proclaimed, but my excellent staff will still exist. Uh, although the office will have a reduced mandate and will be part of the Auditor General's office, uh, we'll still have uh, the obligation and the right to report to the Ontario Legislature uh, on energy, environment and climate. I've been in touch with the Auditor General and we're trying to figure out how this is going to work. Okay, next question. You highlighted a number of problems. Was the previous government aware of all these problems? Was it a lack of resources or a lack of focus? Probably some of each. Um, you know, I can never answer why questions. I can only tell you what. Um, many of these issues have been documented for a very long time. Some of them are issues we've reported on before. We've certainly reported on the algae issue many times before. So I guess in terms of why the government does or doesn't do why, what it does, you'll have to ask them. Okay. What was the current government's response to your report? Um, generally, it was a stand pat response. You know, we're, we'll, we are working on being good stewards or something like that. But there wasn't any specific commitment to do anything new. Okay. Would the expansion of the Green Belt help to address some of the issues you raised? Uh, it might. I mean, it might help address some of the destruction of natural heritage areas if there's real protection. You see, that's one of the things we keep pointing out is that there's lots of line, drawing lines on the on the ground, but whether they, to me, the only real test is over time, are these areas permanently protected? And what we see is continuing loss. Private septic systems are a source of nutrient pollution. Have you looked at this problem? Well, we do report in the Clean Water Act section on the effectiveness of the Clean Water Act in reducing septic system failures in, for example, the Lake Simcoe area. So a lot of time, effort and resources went into telling the people in that area that all of their systems were going to be inspected. There was a lot of information provided. And when the government, or sorry, when the risk management officials actually got to the point of inspecting all of these systems, they, they found that uh, they had been improved and the, the failure rate was less than is generally found across the province. So that's one of the things where we say, all right, so we've learned something. We know that septic systems have fa high failure rates. We know that in most of Ontario, almost all of Ontario, septic systems are almost never inspected between the time that they're installed and the time they catastrophically fail. Uh, and a lot of them leak during that period of time. So the Clean Water Act has shown that an inspection system works to reduce septic system pollution. So why are we simply ignoring the septic systems for the that, if, that threaten the drinking water of the 15% of Ontarians? Okay, could you please speak more on how to apply source water protection to the huge watersheds in the north that do not have conservation authorities? Um, Yes, yeah, so one of the things we looked at was the indigenous communities, um, that they can do some of the work of conservation authorities in, within their boundaries, uh, 
And in many cases, they're looking for uh, resources and capacity assistance. We rec Last year when we looked at the uh, just appalling situation of drinking water on First Nations Reserve, we did call on the province to do more to provide assistance to the First Nations uh, so they could protect their sources of drinking water. And some of the First Nations are cooperating with nearby source protection uh, authorities, but there's there's clearly room for a lot more to be done for them. Um, in terms of the other smaller communities, definitely it, the conservation authorities provide expertise and a structure that is really, really useful. Uh, if the government uh, chose not to turn its back on source water protection, um, they could provide some funding for northern communities to do some of this work themselves, but they don't seem to have chosen to do that. Is the government properly enforcing environmental laws? Well, as we've shown in the, in the water pollution chapter, no. Um, there are they, they enforce them for some things and not for others. Are the incentives for agriculture sufficient to take farmland out of protection to reduce phosphorus runoff? Well, it's not that we're calling for farmland, good farmland, to be taken out of production. Um, the Toby Barrett, a, a backbench um, PC MPP, has proposed a bill to allow farmers to take marginal land out of production or to give it a rest. Uh, I don't know that we need a bill for people to voluntarily take land out of production. They can. There certainly is a tax issue that if a farmer uh, takes some of their land out of production and if they rent their land, they get punitively taxed on that, so that creates an incentive to keep farming marginal land that shouldn't be farmed and which is causing environmental damage. Uh, generally, we don't see enough incentives that are actually tied to improvements. The farmers get a lot of public money, but they're not tied to performance. So we, we do think that farmers should, instead of subsidizing diesel use by farmers, we think the government should support ecological services provided like farmers, like preserving woodlands and wetlands. Um, we do think that there is definitely room, and we've called strongly for financial supports for farmers on, on for the transition if they move from a conventional agriculture to a soil health approach, because they there's you know there's some evidence that they could be at financial risk for a few years, the first few years if they make the transition. Although after all, afterwards they'll be better off. So there's a lot of ways the government could be providing meaningful help to farmers who want to do the right thing. Um, but so far, we're fine. We're, what we're doing is subsidizing diesel use, which is harmful to the to the environment and not fair to the best farmers. Are there other regulatory measures to address road salt? For example, is the New Hampshire certification model one that we should be looking at? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and we do point out in our road salt chapter that there are some things that can be done. I mean, even the region of Waterloo, which is dependent on groundwater for a lot of its drinking water and is seeing that groundwater badly affected by salt, has taken a leadership role in Ontario in providing training and certification programs for private contractors. Um, in the United States, some of the states we've seen recognition that fear of liability causes people to put in far too much salt even when it doesn't do any good and so a private contractor who has been trained on how and when to use salt should be protected from liability if they follow those rules. Um, that would be a very easy thing for Ontario to do. Have you seen any changes over the last year in people exercising their environmental rights? Yes, as we, we showed um, uh, on the chart, we've seen a real upsurge in people exercising their environmental rights uh, in, in the last few years. I'm really glad to see that. Our office has been working very hard to let people know about their environmental rights and how to use them. Uh, I personally have given hundreds of talks around Ontario. My other my staff uh, have also been working hard to increase people's understanding. Um, in addition, I need to give the government some credit here. The new registry software, which means, for example, that you can access this, the registry from your smartphone, that makes a big difference. And I think also the effort that's been made, the legitimate effort that's been made to write notices in language that people might possibly be able to understand, that makes it easier for people to use their rights. So, uh, yes, I've been very pleased to see that, and I hope we continue to see it. Are Aggregate Resources Act regulations adequate to protect residential neighbors, and are they enforced? Uh, no. 
We reported on aggregates last year, and uh, clearly the the regulation of aggregates uh, is. Uh, is not adequate. It's not adequate for environmental protection. It's not adequate for neighbors' protection. One of the key issues for neighbors is the haul roads, the, the trucking of aggregate, not necessarily just the pit itself. Um, and that's something that the province has really done nothing to effectively control. The, the province has never exercised any control, any effective control on where aggregate site uh, pits are put. We have far more pits than we need uh, in southern Ontario. Need isn't part of the criterion. And the, um, so yes, we, we, we have a lot of problems with aggregates, even some of the simplest things. So the Aggregates Act was amended, giving the government the power to require pits with old permits to bring them up to date, to do the studies they should be doing, and they haven't been doing it. Do you have any idea why the public is filing more applications for review and investigation? Well, I think it's because people understand that they have the tool better. We've been working hard to make sure people know they have the tool, um, and we've been encouraging people to use them, and they're using them. Uh, I think it also helps that under the previous government, we were seeing, as you, you saw on the slide, um, a better response rate from the government in terms of taking these applications seriously and providing uh, some things that these got better as a result, not by any means all of them. So that encourages people to think that the government is listening. Okay, I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, is the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe good enough to protect wetlands? No, it, it's not. And also, we're at great risk now of seeing that growth plan rolled back or weakened. Um, uh, we're certainly hearing some indications from the province that uh, that's the direction they're going in. Uh, but we can, we will know more about the more recent data. It, the, gov the federal government is quite slow in releasing its, its uh, data, so we're still waiting for the data from 2010 to 2015, hoping to see it fairly soon. Um, but uh, just judging from the aerial photos that we see, wetlands are still being lost. Okay, I think we're about to wrap up. I just would like to acknowledge, Commissioner, we've received some nice comments as well as questions. A heartfelt thank you to the ECO and its staff for their hard work. So thank you, that's very nice. We appreciate that. And we have been getting a lot of lovely letters of support and appreciation from staff and uh, from, from members of the public and keep them coming. They, they feed our spirit. All right. So that will conclude our Back to Basics webinar. I thank you all for tuning in. As a reminder, the full report and today's slide deck, as well as a link to the recording of this webinar, will be emailed to all the registrants in the next few days. And they're also all available on our website, eco.on.ca. If you have any further questions or feedback on the report, you can send them to our office at environmental.protection at eco.on.ca. And thank you all very much for joining us today.